presentation has been done, we will stop recording and we'll open it up to question and answers, any discussions that people want to talk about. Um, if you've got anything in, you know, to ask, please put it in the chat box. Um, I'll keep an eye on that um, and we'll answer any of those kind of questions at the end of the presentation. Um, I've also put on a, in the chat box about the male fertility talk. So that's coming up in a couple of weeks time. So if anyone wants to join on that one, please email me. Um, I think that'll be it. Wendy, I don't know if you're ready. And I am ready and waiting. Okay, dokie. Okay. Fantastic. So, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for inviting me, Sarah, to update you all on the suicide prevention and awareness work that's happening within the trust. My name is Wendy. A lot of you know me as a staff governor. Uh, I also currently work in a urgent treatment centre at the Whitworth Hospice or Matlock. And I also have a one day a week role in suicide pre prevention and raising awareness within our services and our teams across the trust. Suicide can be a very emotive subject and some people may find it difficult to talk about it. So if anybody's struggling with this topic and needs some guidance, please feel free to contact myself or Jamie Broadley after the presentation. Shockingly, in this country, every 90 seconds, someone will take their own life. That's someone's loved one, a relative, a friend, a colleague, somebody's brother, a sister or a child. Male suicide rates amongst middle-aged men are currently at the highest level with varying contributing factors, which I will outline later. The Office of National Statistics report Higher rates amongst middle-aged men might be because the group is more likely to be affected by economic adversity, alcoholism, illicit drug use and isolation. One of the reasons I became, and this isn't within the presentation, but one of the reasons that I came to want to work within suicide prevention was because working in the urgent treatment centres, we were seeing an awful lot of men coming in to the unit in distress had nobody to talk to and had feelings of suicidal ideation. So what did we do with them? All we could do with them was put them in an ambulance and send them over to A&E. And a lot of the time they're assessed in A&E and then they're sent home with very little support. So that's something that we're kind of hoping to address. And we've got several meetings later on this month around how we can get that help that joined up care between DCHS and the Healthcare Foundation Trust. So this is the first time since 2013 that we have seen an increase in the suicide rate driven by the increase in male suicides. 759 young people took their own lives in 2018 across the UK and the Republic of Ireland. Shockingly, three quarters of these were young males. The Samaritans have pointed to worrying trends, including men aged 45 to 59 and an increase in suicide rates in younger people. The suicide rate amongst 25 to 44 year old bracket has also continued to rise. So a little bit about the risks of suicide for men in particular. So men working in low income jobs, precarious employment and lack of occupational status can be a challenge to their masculinity and those out of work the challenge to honour could be even greater. In this context social status as a husband, a boyfriend and or father can be protective. A failed relationship can be the straw that breaks the camel's back and for some it can be the tipping point from psychosocial survival into a crisis. Men don't sometimes realise that they're lonely because they're usually really preoccupied with work and then, for example, the relationship starts to fail. Suddenly, they can be struck by the lack of meaningful support and often turn to alcohol and illicit drugs as a coping mechanism. But we all know that these two factors are often more risky. So here we have a little chart around some of the risk factors. So previous suicide attempts, quite often if they've already attempted suicide, they're quite likely to do it again. History of substance abuse, which I talked about a minute ago, and obviously we all know 
you know, you start taking illegal drugs, the effects that that can have can sort of spiral out of control then. Physical disability and illness. Uh, losing a friend or a family member to suicide. Being exposed to bullying, bullying behaviour. And we all know at the moment with online stuff, there is an awful lot of bullying goes on online and especially for our children. Uh, somebody with a pre-existing mental health condition. The death of a family member. That's not necessarily somebody who's uh, ended the life by suicide. It could be a close friend or your or mum and dad. And sometimes people find it really difficult to cope when they've lost a, a very close family member. Access to harmful means and relationship problems. So there's some of the, the risk factors involved with suicide. So you'll see on this slide, um, some of them relate more to men than women. So let's take a look at relationship breakdowns as an example. So when a relationship breaks down and is in trouble, you know, your girls, you're more likely to go out and reach out to your mates and your family and girls at work and you'll go down, you know, for a glass of wine or a spa and talk about your bloke um, and other family members, whereas men, on the other hand, are less likely to talk about it. So that's why we're encouraging open and honest conversations. Talking about how you feel can be therapeutic and feel like a weight's been lifted off your shoulders. Giving someone permission to talk openly is also essential and should be handled sensitively. Once you've gained that trust, please listen rather than talk over them. According to the latest findings on male suicide provided by a new report from the NCIHS, which is National Confidential Inquiry into Mental Health, the key messages that have come out are middle-aged men are the group that are highest risk. Rates of contact with services were actually higher than expected. Um, so I find that a bit not, I don't know, I, I always think that men don't go to services, um, but they clearly are doing it. I'm, I'm pleased to see that. That's really encouraging. There is a role in prevention for the primary care, A&E, the justice system and mental health services, advocating that all should work together on recognition and response to males' needs. More than half of the middle-aged men who died had a physical health condition and over a third were prescribed opiates from their GP, which added to the risk. Men who sought mental health help were often untreated. Around half the men who died had self-harmed. Recognition of risk by services after self-harm is really vital, as further self-harm may involve something much more serious, like hanging. The report also states that many of the men in the study had been affected by bereavement. Suicide methods were often looked on the internet. I know this, this it says here, initiative to consider online harm by the Law Commission, but I know that people have said, you know, they've, they've been online, they've looked what you can do. And I mean, I can't ever imagine myself that you would want to do that, but it's out there. So I think we need to do something about stopping that availability. And finally, it reports that a small number of men uh, weren't in contact with any support at all. And I, I understand that because in our urgent treatment centres, when they come in, and they, they quite often come in with a bad back or headache or something. <coughs> Excuse me. And you think, no, no, no I'm, I'm not buying that. And you say, you know, are you feeling OK in yourself? And say, well, I'm a bit down at the minute. And I'll say, have you seen your doctor? Most of them say, well, no, because nobody wants to listen. And then as you talk to them, you know, it says, well, actually, you know, I, I have actually thought of ending my life. So they're coming in with a headache. By the time they go, we've given them a bit of help with the mental health. So what about what we're doing across the trust? So the trust commitment to suicide awareness and prevention. <clears throat> so putting all the reports, statistics, risks aside, what can we all do to help raise awareness of suicide prevention in males? While statistics show high rates in middle-aged men, men in generally are showing higher rates in many of the age groups. So we have to focus on how to help prevent. So in 2018, after we'd had an increase in mental health presentations in the minor injury units, all four of them, and after a family member had experienced first-hand loss of his best friend, 
I spoke to the execs about my concern that there wasn't enough being done by the trust. And in May 2019, our chairman, Prem Singh, signed the membership form for the National Suicide Alliance, which has provided us with some valuable resources, which you can access online. It has helped us form our own suicide prevention strategy and has put us in touch with amazing projects, ideas and collaborative working. So what we're doing well, well I hope we, we are, um, we now have a very thriving suicide prevention and awareness group founded by myself. And I don't know if all of you know Dr. Alan Blair. He works in psychology services and he's um, he's like my mentor. So everything I do, I always run past Alan. Uh, brilliant guy. Uh, we've got over 25 members from different services across the trust who want to learn about suicide prevention. Our most recent members have been from the BAME community, living with long-term conditions and LGBT. Um, during COVID, we have learned that the LGBT community have been the ones that have been struggling a lot because if you, if you think about it logistically and logically, if you're transitioning, uh, if you're a young person, you can't tell your mum and dad, um, you know, the only thing you've got is that one person and, and access to to talk about it. And all these services are closed before because of COVID. You can imagine that that, that could be really concerning for a young person. Um We've got some brilliant resources from some of the leading charities, including Samaritans, Sane, Calm, Papyrus. We also work with Derbyshire Self-Harm and Suicide Prevention Forum uh, on county initiatives. And we are also involved in some local projects concentrating on awareness to prevent. One of the projects we're working on at the moment is around High Tour. And for those of you who aren't local to Matlock, you probably don't know, but those of you who do, will know that High Tour is a really big high place that you can weirdly have access to. You can go up in your car, you can walk up. There's lots of different ways of getting there. And we've had quite a lot of suicides off there in the last two or three years. So I'm currently working with Derbyshire County Council, Derbyshire Dales District Council and other healthcare professionals on how we can make that um, more accessible to families, probably get a cafe up there again like it was when I was a child and sort of having all that around will hopefully stop people wandering up there because there's nothing up there at the moment it's just desolate so obviously they go up there take alcohol and the next thing you know mountain rescues out and and we've got another tragedy so I just think you know it's great to be working on such a an important project only this morning I've been out with a fellow project worker from Erewash targeting barbers and hairdressers to train them by the Lions Barber Collective um, on mental health and suicide prevention. I don't know if anybody's heard of Tom Chapman. Uh, he's an absolute legend. He's lost several friends to suicide. He decided to put his grief into good use. And now he, he goes online and does mental health training for barbers. And I think so far they've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of barbers training them how to talk to people what to look out for within their customers and so this morning we've been around my clock and we've enlisted a lot about 15 so really pleased with that project we're also going to take part again this year in world suicide prevention day and we'll be looking for volunteers to help with the projects decided by the working party of which i'm now a member in 2019, several group members attended football matches and distributed hundreds of suicide prevention leaflets. The response from the spectators was amazing. And it was really interesting because, as you know, you're handing out these leaflets, say, hi, you know, I'm from Derbyshire Community Health Service, I'll be doing an initiative around male mental health. And some of them walk straight past you as if, oh, no, we don't want to talk about suicide. And then you get the odd guy start and you say, last year, I was in a really dark place and, you know, I'm so glad I didn't complete. And then you'll see other people listening into that guy. And then the next thing is like, oh, yeah, can we have a leaflet? And then you see them go away and talk. So it, it really does work. It really does. So what can you do? 
well, whether you're suffering from your own suicidal thoughts and mental health or you know somebody who is, the key message that I want to get across to everybody today is talk, talk, talk and ask. Don't ask once, ask twice. If you haven't already done it, go to ASR and complete our Zero Suicide Alliance 20 minute e-learning. We did this because it's quite short. It, it's very modern and in language that we can understand. And what we're hoping to do is if everybody gets online and does that, then we may be able to roll out more suicide prevention training uh, for more teams. We are in the process of getting the four urgent treatment centres done soon. And uh, so if everybody goes online and the trust can see that this is a really important subject to you as employees, and uh, then we might get it rolled out mandatory. So what else can you do? Whatever team you belong to, wherever you work, I know it's been really difficult just lately because of COVID, but you'll have a service area. So make a notice board, highlight what help is available, ask me what resources and I can send them. You can make yourself a, a nice notice board with big words around suicide prevention because, I mean, I did one last year and all, all that said was in big red letters, suicide awareness is prevention. And no end of people looked at it. And this week we're doing um, Connecting with Nature for Mental Health Awareness Week. We've done a board in our reception for that. So if you're feeling like you can't cope, talk to somebody you trust. Tell them the truth and don't hide away your feelings. It's been reported by all the leading suicide prevention charities that talking is the key. Unburdening yourself or allowing somebody else to unburden their thoughts. So if you see, suspect or get the general idea, something's not right with your mate. If he's off his game, ask him. And if he says he's all right, say, are you sure? Ask him twice. So offer to go a walk or say, do you want to go down the pub for a pint or let's go for a coffee and a drink and really talk to them and check, check, check on them all the time. Ask twice. It really does help. Don't be afraid to use the word suicide either. A lot of people are really scared of using that word suicide. So be upfront and ask that person that friend that colleague that family member just say you know you're not you're not having any suicidal thoughts because you'll be surprised how many people will say well yeah actually i have so that's help ask listen tell so i always think people resonate much more if you know you hear a true story not a report not the percentages not the numbers so I'm going to tell you a short story about my best friend, Simon. Simon suffered with his own mental health for years. We live together. He's my best mate. And we often sit down at night and talk about mental health. So not long ago, he was on a trip from London to Brighton. He'd gone down on the train, been to see a friend, was heading back to Brighton to his brothers. And he noticed this young guy who he thought looked really upset. So he spoke to him. And he asked him, you're all right, love? And he said he was. But Simon wasn't convinced. So he asked him again. And on the second time of asking, he became really emotional, burst into tears. And he said, well, no, actually, I don't feel very well. I, I'm going to end my life. And he'd got tablets. He even showed Simon the tablets. So for the rest of the journey, he sat there and he listened to him. He didn't say anything, he didn't offer him any advice, he just let him unburden himself and he listened. I mean, it is fortunate that Simon actually was a trained um, Samaritan years and years and years ago. So I suppose that gives him a bit of a, a head up. So he allowed him to unburden his anguish. So when the train arrived in the station, he thought, oh, I'm not really sure I'm ready to let him go. So he said, come on then, let's go and have a cup of coffee and, and you can tell me a bit more. And off they went and they actually went for a glass of wine. And the conversation continued for quite some time until Simon felt it was safe to part company. And he gave him his phone number and he said, look, if ever you feel that you're at the end of your tether and you can't take any more, give me a call. And he did. 
call him a couple of times. And then just lately, Simon sent him a message and he said, I'm guessing that you well and that you don't really need to talk anymore. And he got a lovely message back. So for me, this is a great example of how offering help really does work. So obviously speak up, reach out. So for the last couple of years, I've been to the NSBA conference and the theme has been the same at both conferences, and that is we need to target before crisis spirals to end of life. So we're talking around from clinicians. So instead of it all being about going to the doctors or, you know, talking to trained nurses or trained doctors or tra getting out there, getting in the community, getting some community projects doing, you know, setting up little cafes where you can go and drop in and have a chat. And <coughs> this is proving to be really popular. So again, we need to target before crisis spirals to end of life. There are lots of groups starting up targeting men in this area and nationally. So we've got a group at the moment called Men Talk in Chesterfield. This is run by a really great guy called Jason Cotton, who, who used to, well, he calls it his lemming years, where he spent most of his time on top of bridges, near train stations, contemplating suicide. And then one day he was stood on this bridge and he, he just had this absolute light bulb moment. He thought, what the hell? I could be doing good for other people instead of that. So he's now formed this group called Mentalk in, in Chesterfield. It, it's from the Proact Stadium. Clearly at the moment it's online because I don't think they're, they're right at that point where they can go back into the Proact Stadium. Um, and he's he's really inspirational and it's a place where you can go and you can have a chat. You can do just what you want and talk about what you want. And, you know, if there's something bothering you, if he can't help you, he knows a man that can. Um, mental, they're not specifically suicide prevention, but they are mental health and they do online forums. And they're going out to what they call turning everywhere blue. So, you know, they've got blue posters and, and blue little cards. In fact, one of the barbers I went in today, there was their card in there. And they said, oh, well, we've signed up to this. And I said, well, you know, sometimes just chatting into enough. This is about how you um, know how to re interact with somebody, having the right tools to spot those signs when it's just a bit different from being down to being at crisis. So if, you know, if you're a person on this call that's uh, suffering with your mental health, then they're worth um, logging into. And we've also got Calm. Well, I've not got my jacket on now. So um, with the campaign against living miserably, this was a, a charity that was formed in Brighton. But the, it's been so popular and so many men go on their chat line in an evening that they're, they're doing lots of uh, fundraising all up and down the country. And so you can get on board with that yourself. And not only will it be great for your own mental health, but it, it will help raise money for other people. So. Charities like Calm rely on donations for all their resources, all their volunteers, manning the chat line, because all these things do cost money. So in Derbyshire, we're running a suicide prevention initiative in gyms and football clubs and advocating sport to improve your mental health. As I mentioned earlier, we've just had Mental Health Awareness Week where the theme was connecting to nature. So grab your mate get your walking boots on and go out there and connect with the beauty of the great outdoors. Another thing that's very popular at the moment is social prescribing. So instead of uh, prescribing medication and drugs and things like that, you know, we're getting more and more social prescribers on board to, to give you access to all those things that you need. So our community, Derbyshire Mental Health Support Line, that's open 24 hours a day seven days a week. It's manned by trained mental health volunteers. Uh, the number's on there, so obviously you can access that from within the chat. So not everybody likes talking face to face. Some people find it really difficult. They don't know what to say. So there's a new initiative 
come called shout text shout to 85258 and apparently you text that you need help and a trained volunteer gets back to you and they won't let you go till they are absolutely sure that you are safe you have got what you need and you're not going to complete suicide and it may take several texts it may take several texts over a few days but it's a free service it's manned by trained volunteers and I would imagine for somebody who doesn't like talking face to face, that would be a really, a really good alternative. One of the things we've managed to succeed across the county is the Stay Alive app. This is another Brighton initiative um, that's going across the county now. So on it, there's, there's lots of little useful hints like a safety plan your life box, pictures you can store that when you're at that crisis point, when you're really feeling, you can't go on this, who do I ring when I'm feeling like this? Things to do at that point, you know, deviation and, and, and everything. So that's free. It's on um, Apple and Google, uh, not Google, Android, sorry, not very technical. Not. Google Play and App Store. Um so it's worth doing. I've got it on my phone, even though I'm not, you know, feeling suicidal and I'm not currently struggling with my mental health. But I've got it there because then if anybody comes in the unit, I can show them that and say, look, you know, get that on your phone. It's really useful, really helpful. And thankfully, um, at last, we've had it personalised for the Derbyshire area. So some of the um, help line numbers on there are specific to the mental health trust and so you can you know ring them whether you're a, a person who's suffering or whether like cause you health care professionals and you need some advice about a patient that's in front of you and you're not quite sure what to do because what we really want to avoid is an ambulance an a and &E. What we really want is great pathways between our trust, the mental health trust, so we can say, I've got somebody in the department and they are having suicidal thoughts. So instead of them going sitting in A&E for four hours, they will get seen much quicker. So we're working on that at the moment and I hope to be able to have some news around that soon. So we talked, we talked earlier about the risk of suicide and how we can help each other from becoming mentally unwell by connecting, talking and asking. But what actually happens when somebody has taken their own life to suicide? At the moment, child suicide is also increasing. So that leaves bewildered and heartbroken parents, siblings, grandparents, friends, and there are some specific charities who not only help those bereaved, but for those who care for a child and may need their help. For example, Papyrus, Young Minds and Samaritans. So they are there with lots of useful information. So if you've got a child or you know somebody who's got a child who's struggling, you can access lots of useful help through Papyrus and Young Minds. Samaritans are amazing. They're, they're at the heart of everything really they're 24 7 they're there for all sorts of things not just mental health <coughs> excuse me so you could be the father brother or uncle who needs support with your child or family member or help coming to terms with loss and helping with coping remember the pressure as we talked about earlier of children and young adults facing exams gender identity bullying etc I do apologise, I've got a bit of hay fever. As we saw earlier in the key messages from the report, many of the men in their study had been affected by bereavement. It has been well documented that people affected by the loss of a loved one to suicide are at high risk of taking their own lives. So it is good that Derbyshire have enlisted specialist help run by the Tomorrow Project. Calls are answered by trained suicide bereavement counsellors. We're hoping to have one of their counsellors give a talk to the Suicide Prevention Awareness Group in July, because not only was she uh, is she a trained bereavement counsellor in suicide, she also lost her own sister to suicide. And I often think people that have had experience of loss make excellent advocates to know how to deal with other people. 
So, in closing, obviously trying to include everything that I've learned from my role would take me all day. And it's important that I emphasise that my role is around raising awareness and prevention in suicide. I'm not a mental health trainer. I haven't got any mental health training background. This is just my passion. And I want everybody on this call to think really seriously about some of the things we've talked about and to offer help to other people. I'm always happy to have a phone call from somebody if they want some resources or if they want to me to connect with their teams and do a presentation, then I'm happy to do that too. And if you do need any help, please do not hesitate to contact. And so for now, I ask that you keep talking, keep asking, and in a world where you can be anything you like, please be kind because you really never know to what extent someone else is struggling. And if you are struggling yourself, please don't be afraid to ask for help. So that's me in a nutshell. So if anybody's got anything they want to ask or talk about or anything like that, please speak up. Okay. Thanks, Wendy. For that. That's brilliant. Oh, we'll stop. We'll just stop the recording and.